So we're going to start with a question, which is an amazing question. Lama say, we see that the, not the people who like they go out and they, they go and they pick their nose and they talk to Shem for five minutes. They have, they're not necessarily Matzliach and they're Hibodah Dut and Evers. But the people who they really do every single day go out for an hour and they make it their business and they're very serious about their work and they're very serious about their learning and they're very serious about their family. The things are Matzliach. So the question is, what is it about Hibodah Dut that is so effective? Okay. So there's a few elements of Hibodah Dut that are very, very powerful. And I'm going to give simple answers. And then there's also deeper answers. One thing is like this. The whole essence of Paro, says the Ramchal, is his whole being is bound up with trying to distract you. Because the Ramchal explains that a Jew, when he's able to think clearly, wants only what's good for himself, for his family, for his friends, spiritually, physically, X, Y, and Z. And the only thing that can prevent a Jewish person from pursuing those good things and not pursuing something else, which is not like that, is to be distracted. To be distracted. You did. Please stop doing that. Is <laughs> to be distracted. What do I mean by that? What you just did. <laughs> that's his whole drama. You're not here, you're not there, you're nowhere. Nowhere. Does that sound familiar? All day. Okay. When you're learning, you want to be working. When you're working, you want to be we learning. Spoke last, we spoke last. Yes, we spoke last night. Stop yelling. People I'm, not, I'm not yelling. We spoke I'm, last I'm night. Okay. We spoke last night. We spoke last night about the fact that our generation, we're literally everywhere, but we're nowhere. And then. 100%. You're at work, you're on your phone. Right. You're at work, you you're thinking. More free time. You're at work, you want to be home. Yeah. When you're, when you're at home, you can't take being home, you want to be at work. 100%. Okay. When you're, when you're in shul, you're thinking about, but well, what about work? People don't live in the now. When you're, okay, so why? <laughs> I don't know. I have this problem. I don't know. Why? Because his hour pushes everything off. Like later, do later, whatever. Why? It, it doesn't allow you to have awareness. Because there's one thing the Yetzirah <laughs> wants to do that a Jew does not have issue that. Because the key Rabbi Nachman says to being close to Hashem is to have Yishuv Dad, to be able to think clearly. Because every Jew who's able to think clearly will choose Hashem. And then he'll have a lot of beauty and blessings that come from that. My whole life, everywhere I was, I had FOMO. You're missing out. Yes, everywhere I was. When I used to, to go to this frat party, I was thinking about that frat party. Even though I hated all the frat parties. I went to Tesla, you I, be a Yeah, I went to that frat party. I want to go to that frat party. And every single one, I hated it. I'm sweating. The music's terrible. People are right on top of me. Literally, you couldn't pay me to, to do this. And yet I'm there every day and I'm thinking about the other one and the other one and the other one. And then I'm home and I'm thinking I'm such a loser. How am I not at the frat party? I'm at the frat party. I'm like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with me? I hate this. I don't know why I keep doing this. I'm gonna... And I'm doing this all the time. That's just at school. Now I'm at work. I'm sitting in my cubicle. I have like this little tiny thing. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself like, wow, I went to school for six years for this. And then when I finally did therapy and I'm at therapy, I'm thinking to myself, is this really helping people? And back and back and back and forth. When I first joined Yeshiva, you know, what I did the whole time. I'm looking around at all the books. How for a year. Yeah, how in the world am I going to read all this? And I kept coming to Rev Walken and saying to him, can you give me like a, a schedule, a curriculum, and then I'll get smicha in a couple of years? And he started laughing at me. He's like, uh, uh, yeah, it doesn't really work like that. It's kind of like uh, you're Jewish. So you learn the rest of your life. It's not, yeah. it, it, it's a completely different mindset. And for a year, I kept coming to him, please just give me something so I see it in front of me. He's like, David, just sit and learn. And I, and I couldn't. Why couldn't I? Because the secular world has taught me that the key to being happy is to achieve things, to achieve things, to make a certain amount of money, to achieve a certain thing, to achieve a certain thing, to achieve a certain thing. So what are you constantly busy with? Achievement. What's the issue? What goes into achieving anything? A process. There's a process. But I can't focus on the process because I'm already worried about the result. So where am I? I'm nowhere and I'm miserable and I'm scared and I'm afraid and I'm sad and I'm worried constantly. So I'm looking here, I'm looking there, I'm looking there, I'm looking there. What does Hippodidu do? By going, Rabbi Nachman says, go to a place that nobody is. And go sit and talk to Hashem. 
And the best place to do it is in the woods, in the forest, in a field. Why is he telling you to go to these places which are very bizarre and not fitting within with normative society? That I'm going to go to Pat Dolan Park and go talk to Hashem for an hour when I should be working, when I should be doing with my family. Yeah, it's not safe. Let's just say to go. Whatever. I'm just, I'm just making. No, it's not. <laughs> Listen. To go one o'clock in the morning and you. Trust me, it's a lot less safe to be doing what you guys are doing at night. Okay. Think about it. <laughs> okay. Just don't ask these questions. Okay. Embarrass yourself. Okay. No. So let's <laughs> talk about all the cholesterol you eat from up across. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The you're watching. Okay. So now, what happens when you go there? Then you have to confront a reality with yourself. I am Moshe. I am Barry. I am Ellie. What am I here to do? You're immediately going to ask yourself, "What am I doing?" And you're going to have to answer that question. And when you answer that question, because you're asking that question away from the world, you're able to think clearly about it, not get overwhelmed by it, not get stressed by it, but actually get excited by it and go after it. That's why you say Shema with your eyes closed. Yes, it's exactly what Rav Natan says. Because you cannot see the world at the same time that you're trying to have a Muna. Wow. Wait, what? Listen. When you say Shema Yisrael, very good. When you say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, Rav Natan says, why do you, and Rav Nachman says, why do you close your eyes? Because the world is Alma de Shikra. Because the world physically is a lie. It makes you think something. What do I need to do? I need to build up to the point that I'm thanking Hashem, that I'm doing Korbanot, and now I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to enter into a Muna. Why do I have to close my eyes to do that? And not only that, I can't even trust myself to close my eyes. I have to get my fingers on my eyelids just to make sure I don't open them by accident. And say, Shema Yisrael, Shem Elkeinu, Shem Echad. Everything is Hashem. Why do you have to close your eyes? Because you cannot look at the world and at the same time have belief in Hashem because the world doesn't look like that. The world doesn't look like that. Very good. So what does he bode do? He bode is one hour Shema Yisrael. Shanit is not a guy. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's okay. I don't want to offend her. So, yeah. So what is it? Listen, every day I go to Hashem, I say, Hashem, Hashem, what do you want from me? You're going to get an answer. Rabbi Nachman says when a Jew is alone with Hashem, he's going to experience Ruch HaKodesh automatically. Meaning what? You're going to have an issue with Parnassah. You're going to have an issue with your family. You're going to have an issue with the vote at the Shem. You're going to have an issue with this. If you go to the woods, to a field, to a forest where you're completely alone, away from secular society, and you ask yourself, Hashem, what am I going to do? You are going to feel an answer pop up in your head. What is that answer? Rabbi Nachman says it's Ruach HaKodesh. That the Koach of every single Jew is they're able to experience Ruach HaKodesh when? When they go alone with Hashem. Okay? Is there any precedent for people being alone with Hashem? You see it all over the Torah. Avram Avinu talking to Hashem about Sdom. You see Yitzchak Avinu is praying in the field. You see Yaakov Avinu is out in the field by the ladder. You see David HaMelech is doing Yippur it every single day. It became Tehilim. You see it everywhere. Chana is praying to Hashem, asking Hashem. That was not in a prayer somewhere. And we learn how to pray from Chana. Okay? So what's the whole point of all of this? Hashem placed the Koach in a Jewish neshama that when he goes and speaks to Hashem alone, he's able to uh, derive within himself a ruach of what Hashem wants from him. When can't he do that? When he's on his phone. When he's surrounded by his friends who are chasing after money. When he is uh, watching things uh, uh, X, Y, and Z and doing all these things. What are you unable to do? experience the truth. You cannot experience truth at that moment. Rabbi Nachman doesn't even just say, go to a place nobody has. He says, go to a place nobody's been. Now, I don't know how you find that place. But why does he saying to be so makpid in this? When he actually says, that according to halakha, you should never be makpid on anything. You should fulfill the basic halakha. We're not angels. Go learn the basic halakha. Go do it. Do not be extreme in anything. He says that any person who's makpid in halakha is going to be sad his whole life. Okay? Really? Yes. Wow. <laughs> yes. So Chal of Israel is that doesn't care? No, if, if Chal of Israel is the basic, it, you have to look into what the post scheme say. If that's basic, so then you should keep it. He says, if you want to take one thing on yourself and make that your mitzvah, that's good. But to start being makpid on things, he says, it's a surefire way to be sad and anxious your whole life.
to be um, yeah meticulous. I'm going to be meticulous. I'm going to do the chumrot on all the mitzvot. And by the way, I've seen it in a, as a living reality. The people who try and do this, they're miserable. OCD. Unless they're on the level. OCD. Unless they're on the level. Then they're not being makpid at that point. Right. That's exactly. just the level. Exactly. It's a whatever it is. There's no makpid. Right, right. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Yes. And then the same thing Rabbi Nachman says by uh, by Sidorim. When you go pray, don't do kavanot. Why? Because he said those people who are really doing kavanot, that it's real for them, they see that when they simply say the words. Correct. So for them, they're also not trying to do something. They're doing things. Rabbi Nachman's whole entire avoda is stop trying to do things. Just go do things. I walk you to say something. Yes. Just do it. Yes, just do it. Rabbi Nachman was very similar in this way. I learned a lot from Rav Walken about what Rabbi Nachman meant in practice. Okay? So, be normal, be normal. yes. Just do it. Because what happens, there's a Yetzirah clothed on a mitzvah. You learn this new thing that's really big now. That you do this mitzvah this way. And then all of a sudden, you get, like, you spend a lot of money on it, and you get busy with it. But what didn't you do during that time? Grow as an individual. Grow as a human being. And you keep taking these things on yourself. And what don't you do? You probably don't even keep the halakha as it actually is. You're busy doing all the chumrot. And also you haven't grown as a person. The halakha is in order to give you a structure. Go do it. And now go work on yourself. What does that mean? Go work on yourself as a husband, as a father, as an employee, as an owner, as, a, as an Eved Hashem. And where do you do that work? You do it in your hippo to do that. You talk to Hashem, you have an honest conversation. That's like one. In your mind, that you're, for example, if you're, work, if you're, if you're if somebody that doesn't want to get a job, or you've been lazy for your job, or yeah. you put yourself, you're saying to become better at your job, it's not to think how you can become a better job, it's to actually do it in your mind. It means that you need to go, you need to go focus on action. But your ability to focus on action is dependent on your praying to Hashem to achieve it. Because everything that you're not doing right now, it's because it's above your ability. Rabbi Nachman says that when you go pray to Hashem about something that you want in your life, you're taking it from potential and making it actual. He says that when a person learns a lot of Torah, but he doesn't pray to Hashem, it actually ends up becoming a, a chesaron for him. Sure. It ends up becoming a detriment to him because he's receiving a lot of light and he has no vessel for that light. No keli. Yeah. And I see this all the time, that, that the people who they come in, especially Bali Tshuva, they come in, and they even not Bali Chuva, and they just start learning and learning and learning because they're told that this is the uh, this is the epicenter of Judaism. Just, learn, just, learn. just learn, 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 and their mom is depressed, scared, anxious. They have issues at home. They have issues with this. Yes, yeah. Okay. What's the reason? Because he says that the the whole point of learning Torah, and this is the Baal Shem Tov Shita as well, the whole point of learning Torah is to go do it. He, Baal Shem Tov was very against that you're learning Torah just for the sake that it's a geshmak in your mind. That even though there's a place for that and it's good, if it's the whole purpose, if your kavanah and learning is not in order, so you should go do the thing that you're learning, you it's mom should yet a hard cold in a mitzvah. Okay? It should be transforming your life. The whole por- point of Torah should be transformative. When does Torah become transformative? Like Rabbi Nachman says, when you take the Torah that you learn and you pray to Hashem to experience it. You learn a certain thing over here, it resonated with you, go by yourself and say to Hashem, help me to experience that physically in my life. About everything. You hear something in a shiur, it resonates with you, whether it's about Parnassa, whether it's about Amuna, whether it's about Shalom Bayit. You can't just go experience it because above your existence. You have to ask Hashem to help you to be able to experience it. That's the whole relationship. Learn something new, go ask Hashem to experience it. Learn something new, go ask Hashem to experience it. So Hibodu gives you an opportunity to do that, meaning to turn potential into actual. My whole life, and especially after I became Olchuva, I am one walking ball of potential. And by the way, every man is like this. The reason why is because in Kabbalah, we come from a sphere called Hochma. Hochma is the word whatever koachma koachma chokma koachma what does koachma mean potential the essence of a man is that he represents potential the essence of a woman is that she's actual one of the reasons why men and women are constantly fighting is because the essence of a man is to float i want to do everything but lama say not doing anything the essence of a woman is to get stuff done. However, the issue is that there's a process. Does everybody understand that? So each the man and the woman is lacking on their own, and that's why they need to come together. Oh, I was looking for a line of 
potential. Don't let potential be written on your tombstone somewhere else. Oh, okay. Someone said that. Someone said that recently. But but this is this is a very important thing. This is a very good thing. Do you ever hear about women as kids looking out the window and daydreaming? Women? Yeah. As kids. Women and kids, or no women? women and... When women, just girls. Do you ever hear about the concept of girls at school? Yeah. They're sitting in class. They're looking at the and they're daydreaming. Be honest. Think about it. Oh, How much did Moshe daydream as a kid? A lot. A lot. How much did you daydream as a kid? How much did you daydream as a kid? I was mama's daydreaming all day at I school. Remember. I was doing more time daydreaming than learning. I wasn't learning no, nothing. I don't I remember like, anything at school. One thing I remember in eighth grade, seventh grade, I was sitting, you know, they had those bars. Yeah. I felt like I was in jail. It was nice weather towards the end of the year. Yes. And the guy was walking free. I'm like, why am I in jail? Okay, good. Do you know why you feel like that? Because the essence of a male soul is hochma. What is hochma? It's unlimited potential. But it's nothing actual. You know what it's like? It's like a blank check. Every Jewish man is a blank check. What's the benefit of a blank check? It could be anything. And what is there? What's the drawback of a blank check? It's, it's nothing. It's nothing. So, this is, is every Jewish man. Comes a Torah to say it's not good for a man to be alone. What do you do? A wife. You go get a wife. What happens to the wife? She goes, go get the groceries, go shopping, go get the money. What are you doing? Go get the house, go get the this, go get the that. You're like, oh my God, ah, you're dying. <laughs> so what is yeah. that? No. Wait, wait, wait. No, no questions. No questions. No questions. What's Sorry. the purpose? You guys know what this is. Uh, okay, so you have already like some female elements of your soul already. You're rocking it, so you're good to go. It's yeah. easy for you. But I'm just saying. Go this. Go that. Do this. You yeah, don't have a minute to breathe. No, but okay, but true. I don't so I want to explain. What is it like in general for a woman? She comes from a sphere called Bina. Bina, wisdom. Bina is understanding, but Kabbalistically, what does it mean? It's no longer potential. It's where you take potential and you start to actualize it. Like for instance, hochma is a thought just pops in your mouth. How many times in your mind you have a good business idea it just pops into your head? That's called hochma. But if you're to take that idea and make a time in your day that you get around with your boys and you start to actually draw out diagrams and, and plan, that's called Bina. I'm now going to contemplate my thought. That's female. Need a woman partner. Yes. So in your mind, you also need a woman partner, meaning you can't just have good ideas. You have to flesh out the idea. That's called the female aspect of your mind. Wow. And in your relationship, in your relationship, you have the same thing with your wife. Everybody, I have, an, I have ADD and I have an issue with the, 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 the vibrate. So if you could just take vibrate off and put it somewhere else, that'd be great. Thank you so much. So what happens when you're with your wife? So to speak, this is a physical representation of these two aspects of your mind. You are like that walking idea. And she is the concept of trying to take that idea and actualize it. What would a woman be like? You have a number on her check. She takes that blank check and she writes a number. What's the benefit of that number? Money. You now have money. It's real. What's the drawback of the number? It's limited. It's limited. <laughs> Everybody hop. This is the whole essence. Again. Okay, okay. <laughs> good. Good, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. What's the hop? Yeah. What's the hop? Without a woman, you're nothing. You could be wrong woman, you're also not good. Well, okay, take it easy. First of all, until you get married, people who are not married, they can't have opinions on women. I just I this is my sheet in life. Until you get married, you have no nobody's any idea what they're talking about when it comes to women, okay? That's first of all. Secondly, secondly, what's the concept of female spiritually? Female spiritually means to actualize something that's in potential. The reason why it says it's not good for a man to be alone is because in his essence, he represents unlimited potential. But what happens when a man continues to exist like that without a wife? He remains that way. For him, the benefit is I'm unlimited. The drawback is I'm nothing. Hashem wants you to go get married. Why? So you, so you can actualize your potential. What happens to a guy? He feels like it's constricting him. He feels that he's having a lot of difficulties in Nisayon that are coming from the fact 
that his wife is telling him to do X, Y, and Z when in reality, she is actualizing all your potential. She is writing a number on your check. Now, the problem for a man is I don't want a number on my check. I want it to be unlimited. But what happens to that person? He never gives birth to anything. Everybody with me? Avram Avinu, if it wasn't for Sarah, he would have invested in Yishmael. Sarah comes and says, no. One, Yitzchak, limited him. Avram's unlimited. He doesn't want to be limited. He wants Yishmael to be good. He wants Yitzchak to be good. He wants everybody to be good. Comes his wife and says, out of the house. Avram's like, what's the problem? He's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. It's all good. We could do it everywhere. And what, is, and what does Shem say to Avraham? Listen to your Listen wife, Sarah. To Listen to your wife, Sarah. Why? Because you are lacking in the sense that you represent unlimited potential without being actual. Your wife actualizes that potential. But if you don't realize that that's what she's doing, you resist. You resist. You resist. But when you understand that she's helping you achieve your purpose of your life, then... You're not only not having a hard time with it, you can embrace it. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of time, but you can actually embrace the fact that she's pushing you to achieve your potential in your life. Okay. So when you go do hibodadut, you have a lot of hochma, but you need to be able to turn it into actuality. You do that by speaking out what you're thinking about. Thought represents potential. You have to make a dot. How do you make it actual knowledge that it's a part of me, that I live with it in my heart? You have to say it. That's the reason why your mouth is in between your head and your heart. Because when something exists only in your head, it always remains in potential. But when you speak out what you learn, then it becomes actual. That's the reason why halakhically there's a question if it's even considered learning if you don't say it out loud. Now, we don't pass in that if you don't say it out loud, it's not called learning, but the fact that there's even a question amongst Chazal, the Hachamim, whether you're really learning, if you're not saying the word out loud, who cares? I'm reading a book. This is what I did my whole life. You may not be learning. Why? Because the learning is when the wisdom becomes Da'at for you, when it becomes internalized and you live with it. Everybody with me? By speaking out what you learn, you're able to actually Mekayim what you're learning. This is the reason why you see Lama say, real breast lovers, real students of Rabbi Nachman, grow infinite amounts in very short periods of time. That you literally see them growing every single day in, 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 in a trajectory that is, that's not normal. How does that happen? So for the same reason that the person says is gonna get in the way of anybody's life from actually doing anything, that's the whole reason they're able to do it. And what is that? One hour of Yiboda did every day. Because they take what they learn and they ask Hashem to be able to experience it and they pray to Hashem to have the power to koach, to be able to follow through, they actually are able to do the things that they learn. Thank you. Amen. It's not one, it's not, it's not a one day. This the real world doesn't work like that. The real world doesn't work that I have an idea, I have a goal, I want something. I'm going to go pray to Hashem and now I'm going to be able to do it. It takes time. It takes time. Like for instance, everything that I've done in the past three years is all in the schut of my hipodidu. If I didn't do hipodidu for an hour a day, I would not have the courage, the confidence to go leave my job in the secular world and join a kola at almost 30 years old with a family. Because according to Teva, that doesn't make any sense. Where do I get the confidence to be able to actualize what's in potential for me? By starting my day every day and clarifying for myself the fact that Hashem exists, that that's a greater reality than whatever the world looks like, that Hashem gave me the ability to do so, and I have to learn how to believe in myself and go after it. And I do it. And I try, and I have to do it every single day. Right? If you ask anybody, if you ask Adalia Fenster, how are you actualizing all of your potential? He will tell you, and I don't know him, and I only spoke to him one time going to the mikvah in Uman. He would tell you, because I speak to Hashem for in one hour a day, and he brought it at least. If you don't do that every day, you don't have the opportunity to take your thoughts and to actualize what your goals are. Meditation. Meditation. It's like, yeah. 
Yeah, hundred, but it's it's about actualizing potential. What's your mechanism? What's my way to go do it? Basically, you're speaking into existence what you what, what you're beautiful. What you want to get done? Yes, and yeah, that's and that speaking out is what allows it to go from on top of your heart to enter into your heart. But we know that water doesn't just go straight into a rock. So how do you? How it do takes you, time to penetrate. But how do you? How do you? It, 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 Today, today's society, they, they become busy with every little stupid thing. And people don't cannot set aside time for the things that are best for them. People need to diet; they don't diet. People need to. to Why work. not? I'm, 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 that's what I'm trying to get to. So, need to do so I'm get, doing no, so, so I'm giving you an answer. The reason they don't do the things that they know are good for them is because they don't do ebola. Yeah, okay, so how do you do ebola? You, you know it's good for you, but you just it's just so many. It just set aside an hour to go to a field and then do it. It's just like. Uh, okay, Barry, I have a question for you. Tell me. Tomorrow or today, later today, I have a deal for you, a business deal. If you do this for the rest of the year, I give you a million bucks. Yeah, understand. Yeah. One second, one second, one second. I give you a million dollars at the end of the year. You do this thing, I promise you you're going to have a million dollars. What do you have to do? Something you would never think you have to do. Go into the woods every day and speak to Hashem for one hour a day. Would, you, would it be difficult for you to find that hour? If you knew you're going to get a million dollars at the end of the year, okay. it'll definitely be much easier for sure. Okay. So what's the point? The point is the reason it's hard is because you don't believe in its value. It's not because it's actually hard to go do it. That's fair. It's much more than a million dollars. That's for sure. Whatever. Yeah, I, I'm dollars. not. That's not the point. The point is simply the things that are hard for us to do. They're not hard in and of itself. They're hard because we don't value them. The reason it's not hard to go to work. Is because we value money. If you valued Ipo to do like you valued money, it also wouldn't be hard for you to go do Ipo to do. I'm not discounting Ipo to do. I'm not. But hear me out for a second. Why do? Why did? Why does it have to be specifically set aside? Set aside a time in a field, and why does it also have to be an hour? We just spoke about all these. Why, why specifically a field, and why specifically an hour? Okay, so the hour. This is part of uh, Emunat Chachamim. Is that when Rabbi Nachman says to do it for one hour? No matter what we could understand, it is simply, uh, it's like a chok. It's like a chok. If you come and you try to say, until I understand why it's an hour, then you're never going to go do the hour. Part of the benefit of the Torah, part of the benefit of um, tzaddikim in your life is that you're not always doing what you understand. If you're always doing what you understand, that means you understand what the person who's teaching you understands, and therefore you don't need a teacher. The whole essence of a teacher is he knows more than you. If he knows more than you, then uh, automatically what he's going to say to you isn't going to make sense to you. That's a good sign. Obviously, if it's totally off, you have no resonation whatsoever, it sounds completely, that's a problem. But if you understand he's coming from a real place and you don't understand his advice, that's a good thing. But that can't stop you from doing it because it's good that you don't understand. Because if you would have understood, you would have figured out your problem already. And you don't, you haven't. Comes Rabbi Nachman to tell you, the answer is one hour a day. Keeps the doctor away. Okay, that's one thing. Two, number two. Number two, number two. Why in the field? Good. Because the world distracts you from thinking clearly. Does it have to be specifically a field? It could be an empty room. You could do it in an empty room, but but I want to get the most bang for my buck. Right? If I'm gonna go invest, if, if I'm gonna go invest, if I'm gonna go invest an hour of my day when the world thinks that's insane, even in the religious Jewish world, that would be insane. I'm already gonna invest that hour in my day to do this chiddush. So I want to get the most bang for my buck. Rabbi Nachman says that when you pray in nature, all of nature helps your prayers. Everything in the natural world also is looking for tikkun. When you go to pray to Hashem, you're rectifying everything around you and they assist you in your prayers and that's why it's easier to pray outside. Okay, that's one thing. Another thing is simply, when you go to a park, when you go to a field, when you go to a forest, something happens to you where you realize that you are living in a fantasy world. You go there and you realize that everything that's going on here, just because everybody's doing it, doesn't mean it's reality. You cannot have the koach to think like that, though, when you're amidst. Where do we see this? Moshe Rabbeinu was not able to pray until he left Mitzrayim. Paro said to him, pray for me. He said, 
no problem, I got you, but I have to leave Mitzrayim first. Oh. Rabbi Nachman says, why do you have to leave Mitzrayim? Why do you have to leave Mitzrayim before you can go pray? Go pray right then and there. Because the prayer gets swallowed up in Mitzrayim and doesn't come out. Because you don't have Yeshuv Da'at to pray to Hashem. He left his presence. No, he left Mitzrayim. He left the city of Mitzrayim. Physical. He left the physical place. Why did he leave the... It's in a pasuk. He just left Mitzrayim. He had to get out of Mitzrayim in order to be able to pray. Why? Because you cannot be with people who are all running after money, sex, this, that, all these things, honor, uh, 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 status, X, Y, and Z, and at the same time be in that space and pray to Hashem to connect to your real self, to find out who you really are, to know your mission in your life. You can mamish feel it. Go, go to... Do two, do 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 two we both do just for an experiment. One time, guys, focus. One time, you do it outside. The next day, go to a hotel somewhere. No, nobody says this. I'm saying go to a hotel, go to a hotel, and go do we both do it in the hotel. Where is there a field? Pat Dolan Park, right over there. Pat Dolan Park. Okay. Drive east, across oh, the behind it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a beautiful field. Beautiful, beautiful trail, beautiful field. There's a lake, there's woods. There's, but there's also, little... Rabbi, for the people that obviously haven't been starting, if they start with 20 minutes, it's also a start, you know? You yeah, just, of course. It's... They don't do one hour a day in, in the beginning. Okay, listen. You just clock out. No, 100%, but. I'm sure you, unless you did start with No, hour. so I want to tell you something. I did 20 minutes a day for years, and my life was hell. So I, I, I am not, listen, I, I didn't leave my job so I, I can do Kiruv. I'm not doing Kiruv. Rebbe Nachman says at least one hour a day. I'm going to come and tell you 20 minutes is good enough. What am I, retarded? Do I, do I know? Do I know what Rebbe Nachman knows? Now, obviously, to get to an hour takes time. But if you're not doing the 20 minutes, knowing that the hour is the goal, you're going to be at 20 minutes your whole life. Is it quality over quantity? Like, if I can get all my word done in half an hour? No. No. It has to be an hour? It yeah. Matter what he says at least an hour. Could you sit there? You have nothing to say. Yeah, but yes. Gedalia Rep- says there's time where you, where you go. And- I'm not Gedalia. You could sit there and not say a word? Yeah, it's great. That's also what he He bought to do. It means to be alone. You could sit for Chas one hour Mishala. and not say a word? Yeah, it's a good thing. That's the thing. Yeah, like the main ass. You, you have a whole bunch of errands to take care of. You have a whole bunch of things you got to take care of. You have a whole bunch of errands to do. Okay. Of, to do. okay. Again, 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 again. I have a I have a business deal for you. That's gonna. Uh, that, that's <laughs> yeah. I, I, that's gonna. One hundred percent. That's gonna. That, that's gonna require that you don't go do that errand. Are you gonna figure out another way to get the yeah, errand yeah, done? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So stop, <laughs> stop with all of this. Everybody needs to stop. Stop coming no, to me should, and. T- should, should, should both of be like, let's say for example, like uh, somebody has like let's say ten things they gotta take care. Of. So talk about ten things, or focus on one goal at a time and like you know. Do, do you talk about everything. Step. You can talk talk about everything. everything. No you talk about well, everything. You have to start with the Zama. Yeah, and you have, you have to start by saying a Zama. You have to start by saying thanking. good. Thanking and saying good about yourself, for sure. Otherwise, because if you're not, you're going to be in Yayush, you're going to be in despair, and it's actually going to end up leaving worse than you started. Can you start about the all for Shem? You were like this and you are like that, just to kind of get you like a little Yeah, bit. it's great. Okay. Rabbi Nachman says, speak to him like you speak to your best friend. Do you come with a list of things to talk about? He does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Can you give a little like, description or overview of what exactly his point is? Sure. He comes from the root boded. Boded means to be alone. In Israel right now, there is a government decree that we need to be in bidud. Bidud means isolated. Quarantine. Quarantine. What does quarantine mean? Isolated. Quarantine literally means I'm, I'm isolated. Be dude. Such a party for the nanox now. <laughs> forget about nanox. Forget about nanox. Can Just... I ask a legitimate question? What about his question? It's not legitimate. I'm saying legitimate questions. The what about Rabbi him? Nachman, were Jews in the world? Did Jews exist? Did they have connection to Hashem before Rabbi Nachman? Before all the stuff with with, with yes. did they exist? Were they connected to Hashem? Yes. All of a sudden it comes. I'm not nothing against Rabbi Nachman. He's awesome and he's amazing. But by saying that one hour you have to, you just. Did you ever? Did you ever look at Masechet Brachot? Yes. And what did the Those what, are what did they all used to do? Those are Hasidim again. Okay. Then you have average Jews. 
Okay. That's like expecting an average guy to do bodybuilder workouts. Again, again, this is the Chiddush of Rabbi Nachman ben Fega. You know, there's a pasuk. It's not a it's wait, Kedish. wait, not that, not that, not that. Something else. Mm -hmm. The pasuk says that Klal Yisrael is kulam tzaddikim. The pasuk says that we're all tzaddikim. Okay. <laughs> so that's nice. That's very nice. And by the time Mashiach comes, we have to actually be that pasuk because it's a nevuah, it's a prophecy. Right. Great. They used to say to Rav Natan, what's so great about Rabbi Nachman? They have all these tzaddikim, they mamish, they perform open miracles. This guy does this, this guy does that. You mamish have a Hasidic Rebbe who's the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov and you never hear about any miracles that he does. No, nothing. And he said, you don't think Rabbi Nachman can, could do those things? You know what was the greatest miracle for Rabbi Nachman? That he could take anybody from whatever place they're coming from, whether they're coming off the streets, whether they're addicted to drugs or to porn or to gambling, whether they are stuck in the greatest depression in history, whether they are chasing after money and they have no priorities that are actually based in reality. He could take that person and make that person a tzaddik. But Natan said for Rebbe Nachman, this is a much greater miracle than to do things that make you uh, be impressed with the things that he does. So the whole Chiddush of Rebbe Nachman is that if you attach yourself to him, then you all attain the level of Hasidim and you do the hour. Rebbe Nachman is the first one to believe that every single Jew is a tzaddik in practice. In practice. I understand that everybody believes that Jews are tzaddikim, but Lamaz say, you know, when they give you a uh, when they give you a seder of go learn for ten minutes today before you go to work, uh, and go learn ten minutes before you go to sleep, and that's your achieving the purpose of your life, they're lying to you. That's not true, and you know that. No, it's good. No, you should learn before at nighttime. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the concept of that my main priority is the secular world and I'm gonna make time every day to do this and that. That's Sheker, that's not a real thing. Your whole entire physical life is supposed to be a means to experiencing your spiritual life. Your work is supposed to be so you can put your, support yourself so that you can grow spiritually, so that your wife feels so that your children have what they need. It was never supposed to be and you're not gonna see in any Musar book anywhere, whether it's Sephardi, Ashkenazi, this and that, that somebody says that a goal in your life should be to make as much money as possible. You never saw it. You show me one place. So if nobody ever said it, to come along and say our generation's different, you know what you're saying? I know better than thousands of years of people who are connected to the ultimate reality. I'm not uh, arrogant enough to say that. Okay, so now I'm just saying like this, very, very simply, very simply. The whole Chiddush of Rabbi Nachman is he says, you attach yourself to me, I'll make you into a tzaddik. So then the question is not even a question anymore. Because if you're a tzaddik, then you're a chassid. It doesn't make a difference. Okay, back to his question for a second. Question was, what does he bode do? It comes with the word bode, which means to be alone. What does it mean to be alone? It means that nobody's around you. Nobody's around you. Ultimately, you can get to a point that you can be bodet even when everybody's around you. That's a very high level. But how do you get to the point that you can literally be alone even when you're surrounded by people? You need to first actually go physically make yourself alone so you see what it's like. Because the whole entire essence of the Sitra Akhra is to distract you with distractions, physical distractions, things that are not allowing you to go run after and to chase after your truth. And when these distractions come up, they're so powerful, they're so palpable that you don't have the power to then turn away from them. So Rabbi Nachman says, go alone and talk to Hashem. Because by doing that, you're going to remove yourself from the distraction and you'll have a time to sit and think in truth. Does that mean that when you're doing it in the beginning, you're also not going to be thinking about this and that? No, it's a process. But if you keep going and you don't give up on it, you're literally going to feel peace when you go do Ipoh Dude. And when you feel that peace, you're going to realize that's really what you want in your life. And then you can go take that feeling and say, I want that during my day. How do I achieve that? 
and you go back to the field and you ask Hashem to help you. Bodet simply means to be alone with Hashem. Rabbi Nachman says, if you go for an hour and you don't talk to Hashem for that whole hour, is that he bodet do? 100%. He says that is very beneficial for you. The act of being alone with Hashem is the essence of Hibodajit. The best way to do it is to talk to Hashem. Why is tefillah not enough? Why is tefillah three times a day not enough? Because the Rambam says that tefillah itself is only to replace the korbanot. The Ramban says tefillah is that you say what you need personally. When did you do that if you're doing shachri mincha and arvi? The Ramban says that the mitzvah of tefillah is that you have tzorche, you have needs, and you ask for them. The needs that you have in your heart, you ask Hashem for them. That is tefillah. So according to the Ramban, if you don't physically say to Hashem, I'm struggling with this and I didn't, I didn't, I need this, you haven't even done tefillah. Yeah, you haven't done tefillah. You have those good times. Good. I want to ask you a question. How much time do you spend looking out after, looking for answers to your problems? No, no, no. You know, every person here, you go, you ask for advice from your friends, you talk to your friends, you schmooze with your friends, you're, uh, uh, you're going after this business deal and having this business advisor, you're going and speaking to this lawyer, you're talking to these friends, and what are you looking for? Solutions to your problems. Everyone's looking for solutions to their problems, no? Nobody does this, I'm the only one, everyone, er nobody else speaks to their friends about how do I figure out my stuff? All the time. Everyone's doing it every day, you're doing it all day, every day, even when you... So I'm going to ask you a question. If the answer is, if the answer is that you don't need to ask your friend and you can go to a field and take all of those hours that you spend schmoozing and you have one hour that you schmooze with Hashem and the rest of your day you can go run after your life. So then where is the time? I spent less time. It's a huge, huge, huge misunderstanding to think that a person who does one hour of Yibo to do it has less time in his day. I have more time than anybody because I do an hour. Because I do that hour, I don't waste the rest of my day. Everybody I know wastes their entire day and they come back the same day, except they have one more gray hair the next day. And they're asking and they have the same problems as they did five years ago. I don't, why not? There's nothing special about me. There's nothing unique about me. If you go to Uman, you're gonna see, I'm saying the real people, the people who are really going for the right reasons, not going for a party. You're gonna see that they transform and change every single day of their lives. Why? Because they're spending one hour talking to Hashem a day. They're clarifying for themselves what is my priorities in my life. And then they spend the rest of the day running after and not being distracted. But the nature of a Jewish person is because he is Kulam potential, that when he doesn't have that hour that he talks to Hashem, he's going to spend all day talking to their friends, figuring out how can I actually go do this thing. And then 10, 10 years later, you're in the same exact place as you were 10 years ago. He's the cause of your reality. You, you know that Shalom Bayit is a miracle. To have Shalom Bayit is mamash anis. Your wife is nothing like you. She's a different entity than you. You're going to come home and I'm going to go get advice from this person, go to this person, go get this, go get that, go get this, and expect to have Shalom Bayit. You know why you don't have Shalom Bayit? Because you're trying to interact with an entity that is completely different than you. Where's the peace? Where's the peace? You mamash, you need that Hashem should give you peace. Sim shalom. We say this every day, sim shalom. Where does peace come from? Hashem. Peace is a miracle. Where does your parnasa come from? Same place. It's a miracle. It's a nice. All these things are nisi. They're all miracles. Is everybody with me? So, yes. and let me ask you a question for that lack, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever it is that one has their own lacks, is, does he do that specifically because he wants you to go and talk to him? And 100%. Absolutely. And create a relationship with him? Exactly. Exactly. So, you're preventing these kind of problems if you're doing all of it? It's not about preventing, it's about running after a goal. It's about, a, it's about actualizing your potential in your life. A person who does one hour of Ebola doodle a day genuinely and is not scared to, of the answer he's gonna find when he talks to the truth, he is gonna actualize his potential for the rest of that day. And if he does it the next day, he's gonna do the same thing the next day, and the same thing the next day. And by the way, Rabbi Nachman was not the only one to do this. The Havitz Chaim did it two hours before his mincha every single day. I heard from Rav uh, Belsky, I think it was, from Ramansor, he said, and then Rav Belsky, 
he said, if if the Chavetz Chaim, can you imagine what he what he achieved, and he wait and he wasted that time. It is a waste of that time, and he spent that time doing that that he bought to do before his mincha. Imagine if he would have spent that learning. And Rav Belsky, by the end of his life, he said, I realized I was wrong, and the whole reason he was the Chavetz Chaim was because he spent that hour talking to Hashem before. Every day. Before Mincha, he had, he had an addict. He used to go there before Mincha every single day. And he used to talk to Hashem and do Cheshbon and Nefesh for an hour, at least an hour. I heard it was two hours every day. Okay? It's not a Kiddush. It's just that Rabbi Nachman is, uh, is emphasizing it to the nth degree because he saw in his prophetic vision and the final generation, we are going to have the greatest power of imagination that ever was. And as a result, none of us would be actualizing any of our potential. So he says, I have a solution for you. Go talk to Shem. Ooh, talk to me. Ooh, talk to me. Because you know what happens? When you talk to Shem and you tell him what you want to do in your life, you know what you're compelled to do when you leave? Go do it. But you know what happens when you think about doing things? You never go do it. Because speech is what actualizes your thoughts. That's it. Okay? So we're going to do a little bit of Lakut HaLachot. You didn't start it? No. <laughs> this is all a hakdama. This is all a hakdama to our Lakut HaLachot today. But al ken arishon shigila sor chatzot aya Avraham avinu alav shalom. And therefore... The first time that was revealed the secret of Chatzot was to the very first Jew, Avram Avinu, who we just learned about. Oh man, we know that Avram Avinu, off your phone, we have 15 minutes. What? Yeah. We know that Avram Avinu is a microcosm of every Jew. Chazal explained that every single Jewish person is Avram Avinu. And whatever Avram Avinu went through in his life, we all are experiencing through our entire life. And not just are we all experiencing in our life, but that in fact, all of Klal Yisrael is, is so to speak, a macrocosm of Avraham's microcosm. Meaning the fact that Avram Avinu had 10 tests means that the Jewish people over the course of history have to have 10 tests and test them. Really the fact that his life right now? All of us collectively. The fact that Avram Avinu had to fight four kings and overcome all of them means that the Jewish people over the course of history have to overcome four exiles. The fact that Avram Avinu needed to do Lech Lecha and he needed to leave behind everything that he had learned in his life and, uh, and go run after Hashem means that Klal Yisrael has to do the same thing. The fact that Avram Avinu, and you go... What? Avram Avinu put up this hook for Kedosh You also have to do it in your own way. Put your kid on the altar, my friend. No. So the, the whole... The whole so I want to tell you something. The whole... The, you have to... The highest level of a Jewish soul is called Mesir Nefesh. Everybody in their own way if they want to achieve their spiritual potential, which Avraham did when he dedicated Yitzchak, he needs to do Mesir Nefesh. What was the Mesir Nefesh? That Avraham Avinu represents unlimited potential. He represents complete, infinite love. He needed to take the son who he prayed for his whole entire life, who he loved more than any father will ever love their son, and he needed to go sacrifice him. Why? Because that was the ultimate Mesir Nefesh. Every Jew in their own lifetime is going to have to achieve Mesir Nefesh in their own way. That's called their Akedat Yitzchak. For some person, it might be not to go run after money. For another person, it might be that I need to listen to my wife, even though I was told that I need to whip my wife into shape. For another person, it might be that uh, my kid has a health problem, Chas v'shalom, and I have to take away things that I wanted to do in my life so I can make sure that my kid has what he needs. Everybody has their own Mesir Nefesh they have to accomplish. Avram Avinu, when did he go out to destroy the four kings? Listen to what he says. It was at Chatzot. At Chatzot. Kamoshe Katuv. V'yichalek Alehem Laila. That he went to go fight with them at nighttime. Oh. Ki ika v'chinat Chatzot. Because the essence of Chatzot, meaning midnight, da'inu meaning l'shaber tokef ashena, that you destroy the strength of sleeping, that your consciousness is in exile, that you don't see Hashem in your life, that you're not happy with your life. 
You're sleeping. The Shaber Laila. When do you destroy that? Nighttime. And you do it through finding a good point in your life. Specifically, when it doesn't look like there's any. Specifically, when you're struggling, that's the time that's called nighttime. That is the time that you are able to break your sleep, that you're able to wake up. When can you wake up at the highest level? Midnight. But on, on paper, it doesn't make any sense because if you went to any medical doctor and you said to them, when shouldn't I wake up? They would say in the middle of your sleep. Comes Chazal to tell you, you know what the best time to wake up from your sleep is? In the mm -hmm. middle of it. Opposite the opposite. Of Why? Why? Because they have an sleep. No. You break your sleep. Because the whole concept of medicine is rooted in Teva. Nature. No, that's what it is. The whole concept of medicine is we're going to research nature. And based on nature, we're going to give you. And what's the whole concept of Chazal, of the Torah? Uh, to break nature. Uh, to nullify uh, Teva uh, and to go above uh, nature. Uh, so it would make perfect sense that Chazal comes and they say something that goes completely against what the doctors say. And what does Chazal say is the best thing for you? Wake up in the middle of the night when everybody's sleeping and go cry your eyes out to Hashem and go learn Torah. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. What about my eight hours? Eight hours. What about my eight hours? Doesn't make any sense. By the way, you should know something. It's a very deep thing. What happens on Shavuot? Shavuot is, is Ke'en Mashiach coming. Why? Because on Shavuot, we stay up all night and we're learning with Simcha, with joy. What's the whole concept of Olam Haba? That we're having the greatest ecstasy from experiencing greater levels of knowledge. Just go like this. Okay, so Shavuot, by the way, Moshe comes down the mountain. What is this a hint to, says uh, the Hasidic coming Masters, Mechelon, Mashiach coming at the end and revealing himself. And what is he bringing? The, the, Torah. the Torah, meaning the newest, the, the greatest, the greatest newest revelation of godliness, the light of Mashiach. <laughs> and what are we doing? We're up at the mountain. And how do we rep, rep, replicate that? How do we experience that on a miniature level? Once a year, we stay up all night. Why are we staying up all night? It doesn't make sense to stay up all night, no? Isn't, doesn't, shouldn't you get eight hours of sleep? Is it to await and, and anticipate the coming of Mashiach like that? Because Geula is, I'm not bound by nature. Geula is, I'm not bound by nature and I'm awake. I'm awoke. I'm awoke. Alan awake. Yes. Rabbi Nachman used to say, you're not going to listen to my Torah. No problem. I'm going to start telling you stories. I'm going to start telling you stories. Why? He used to say that the world teaches their children stories to put them to sleep. But I teach my children stories to wake them up. You hear? Lost princess. The lost princess. You got it. The lost princess. You got it. That's a good song. You got it. Lost princess. You got it. Okay. Oh, it's, the, it's a great story. I love the cripple. Okay. Ready? So now he says like this. Tova. Like this. But this could only happen that Avram could overcome these four enemies, meaning within yourself, all of your own interpersonal difficulties that you face in your life only because Avram was Isha Chesed. He was the man of kindness. And what's the ultimate kindness? That you judge yourself favorably. Mm. Meaning it's not just that Avram went at Chatzot. He went out at, a, at Chatzot being and judge everybody favorably, oh. including himself. Because he was judging himself favorably, meaning he was kind to himself. As a result of that, now that he went out at Chatzot, he was able to destroy all of his enemies. Because Avram ran after the kings to save Lot. Why? This is what we spoke about. Why is he running after Lot? Lot was a rasha. Because he only saw his good. And that good that he saw was Mashiach. Was Mashiach. Was Mashiach. But the only reason he was able to go, not only go run after Lot, but he destroyed all of his enemies. Avraham murked out all of his enemies. How did you do that? He went out at nighttime. At the pitch of sleep when everybody's unconscious, 
he went to go fight his enemies and become conscious. But he could only become conscious at that time by loving himself and everybody around him. By looking for the good in himself and everybody around him. By doing both, he was able to take Lot out, meaning he was able to extricate Mashiach from exile. And what does that have to do with us? Because every one of us is Lot. And Avram Avinu is the Tzadik Yisod Olam. And he's taking every single one of us in our circumstances. And he's saying, I know you feel bad about yourself. I know you think you're Nebach. And I know your family thinks you're Nebach. I know your friends think you're Nebach. I know everybody around you thinks wow. that you are a lost cause. And where's Lot always located? In places like Sodom. Of course. Like that's Egypt. why the Midrash like says, America. that's why the Midrash says, where did Hashem find David? In Stone. Uh, stone, yeah. stone. From Lot. From Lot. David? Yeah. Yeah. Where's Lot? No, no, no. So listen, wait, wait, the, wait. The Midrash is explaining that Lot was holding on to the soul of Mashiach inside of him. Mashiach comes from Lot. Yeah. Okay. Right. right. So where is Mashiach found? In Lot, in stone. Mm -hmm. He's found in stone, meaning Mashiach is found in the darkest places. But who is the one who's able to extricate the Mashiach from the exile? Only and only the only one. one, his name is Avram Avino, the Tzadik. Like there's a famous uh, line, which uh, Rav, uh, Yosef Karduna turned into a song. He'd carve with the tzaddik, attachment to the tzaddik. What does it bring? Oh, sorry, it says, Biat the Mashiach, the coming of Mashiach. Talui is dependent on he carve with the tzaddik, attachment to the tzaddik. Why? Because there is no way for Lot to get out of stone without Abraham. But the reason why Abraham is able to take Lot out when he himself can't take himself out and nobody else can take him out is because he and nobody around him sees good. But the whole essence of the tzaddik is he sees only good in everyone and within himself, Azamra. Because he's the melech of Azamra, he's able to be the tzaddik and lift up everybody else out of exile and destroy all the enemies. But I can, and therefore, Afal Pisho Lot Rasha. Mamas, that's the next line. Even though Lot was a Rasha, the Torah says he was. Masar Avraham Nasho. Abraham sacrificed himself for that good point. Lahatilo to save him. Bishvil Nakudatova for the Nakudatova. Why? Because Moshe Rabbeinu, when he saw Hashem and he was outside in the, in, in the woods by himself, like everybody thinks that they need to do in order to connect to Hashem, I'm going to go leave behind all my problems and I'm going to go on vacation. And Hashem says to Moshe, I'm in a bush. In the Midra, in the, yeah, and he's in the bush, and he's in the burning bush. And the Midrash says, why did he appear to him in the burning bush? Because the Torah was teaching that the Jewish people were that bush that was on fire. That the Jewish people were suffering in exile. They were suffering in Mitzrayim. They were suffering in the secular world. And the Shekhinah was inside of them. And Hashem was saying to Moshe, he was saying to the Tzaddik, he was saying to Mashiach, I'm not out here in Midian. I'm not out here in the mountains. I'm in the Jewish people. Go find me. Go find me. Go find me. Those suffering souls who are in the darkness. He was telling Moshe that fire that's burning, but they're not being extinguished. Go take them out. Go show them good. And by the way, what's the whole concept of Moshe Rabbeinu? He saw the good in every single Jew. The whole reason he left Egypt to begin with was because he was the only one who did that. And he became a threat. So he had to leave. And where does Moshe's Rachamim come from? This is a very important point, and with this will end. Where does Moshe Rabbeinu's Rachamim come from? His ability to see the good in himself and those around him to the highest level, so that he could be the Mashiach. Because Rabbi Nachman says Rachamim is dependent on Da'at. Empathy is dependent on knowledge. The greater your knowledge of godliness becomes, the more empathetic you are to yourself and those around you. Why? Because the more you realize that there's God in everything and within yourself. Yes. So the more that you learn that, the more you see that. The more you see that, the more you can focus on that. But a person who is not getting that, God consciousness, he can never believe in himself. He can never believe in those around him. They have that. That means that anybody who has any empathy, it means that Hashem gave him natural da'at. The da it, it's a shtickle from it's a shtickle from that. It's a gift. It's a matana. It's a matana. And I'm gonna give you a practical example with this one. Rav Yitzchak Ginsburg said. Rav Yitzchak Ginsburg said that 
Moshe was the greatest teacher who ever lived. And he'll, he's always going to be the greatest teacher who ever lived, even when Mashiach comes. That David HaMelech was the greatest king who ever lived. But Mashiach is going to be the greatest psychologist who ever lived. Why is he saying that? Where is he getting that from? The more empathy you have and what's the whole entire if you go to social work school you go to therapy school you go to psychology school you get your side you get, they're going to do the research and they will show you lamase what do people say is the most healing part of therapy and it blows it out of the water validation empathy 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 do you know why Moshe Rabbeinu is the Mashiach empathy where do you get that empathy from Kula Torah Kula because he knew the whole Torah. Because he had the greatest level of Da'at, he had the greatest level of empathy. And this is what we have to run after, Da'at. How do we get Da'at? From the master of Da'at, the Tzadik. The Tzadik is the one who is holding onto the Da'at because he's the Ruach of Elohim that's hovering over the water. Rabbi Nachman says, what's the water? It's Da'at. He's constantly hovering over it. Your ability to also be on that water is go hang out with the Tzadik. Was the opposite? Cruelty. So sympathy? sympathy is when you feel bad for somebody. And empathy is when, empathy you, is when you, feel act, you feel their pain, you yourself. The worst thing you can... You can't have too much empathy. If you had all the empathy in the world, you're the Mashiach. The Mashiach is going to have the greatest empathy that ever was. Right now, somebody needs a ride. You have to, you have to sit and learn. So you have empathy. You feel bad for the guy. That's not empathy. That's, that's why you need to. That's that's why you have to have that because the real truth is sometimes letting a person figure something out on their own is the greatest empathy you can have for that person. How do you learn that? You have to you have to learn that. That's a greater level of empathy than actually doing it for them. Like for instance, the fact that you didn't give that person a ride, even though on paper it feels like I might have done the wrong thing, you actually had greater empathy by not giving him that ride than if you would have given it to him for yourself and for him. Because he learned, he learned from that moment that there's something more important to you in your life that's very serious for you to have to take care of. And that's what our generation needs to know, that I'm not, I don't have to always be all over the place. I have priorities in my life and I have to go run after them. Okay. Everybody have an amazing, amazing day. We're the push. The consuming, what does that mean, the consumption? What does that mean, the consuming? Because we didn't get consumed. Yeah, we didn't get consumed. What does that mean? It means we're suffering in exile, but we never get extinguished. Ah, uh, so we're never going to get, so we're always going to be meaning, a Meaning a Jew will mama shit for years and years and years and years and years in suffering. Mm -hmm. When another person were to call the quits, because the whole essence of a Jew is hope, is tikva. But at the same time, the masa in the end, he's not getting out of his problem because he doesn't have da. Uh-huh. Who's Moshe? The Rizal says Moshe is Da'at Mamish. So go give them Da'at and take them out of Egypt. Da'at is awareness of Hashem, how great he is. It's, it's, uh, it's close, okay. awareness is close to Hashem. Rabbi. Yeah, you have a, you have a question, Yaakov? Okay. Yeah. Um, so if the if the whole point of like our learning is to be able to do it, so then why don't we just learn Halakha and Musa? Or why learn anything else? Because Halakha tells you exactly what you're supposed to do. And most so of you, to work on that you should learn halakha every single day and it should be the main uh, acre of your learning. So you got it. Okay. But we are supposed to learn Mishnayos and Kamara. We're supposed to learn everything. But right. The, but the That's, essence, and the, the Mishnah says this in Pirkei Avot, you should be, if you learn in order to teach, you'll be able to know it and to teach it. If you learn in order to do, you're going to be able to know it, to teach it, to safeguard it, and to do it. It's just Chazal. He's just, he's right. just, He's just bringing it that this is a reality. We have to live with this fact. Why am I learning? I'm learning in order to makayim. That's the it's a mindset. Right. When I, it's not just about learning halakha. It's that even if I'm learning Gemara, even if I'm learning Musa, even if I'm learning a Mishnah, I ask Hashem, Hashem, please help me to learn this so I'm able to get closer to you through this. But, but but by learning Mishnah, we're not learning the practical things necessarily of what to do. That's what halakha comes to teach. I, I understand that. So that's why Rabbi Nachman says, that the main ikr is halacha. Okay. <laughs>
that, that, but but you know Rabbi Nachman's learning Zeder. We learned it. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, no, no. I I learn I learn I learn all of it. I'm, it's, I'm it's, just, it's everything. But let's let's say let's say you only had ten minutes to you literally. Nobody. This is not a situation for anybody because they can right. make the time. But let's say they really only had ten minutes. For sure, Rabbi Nachman would say learn halacha. Okay. Okay. Right, those are the priorities if you're, if you're lacking time. Priorities that if, if, for instance, you get into a situation where your life takes you away that day from being able to do anything else and you mamish only have a little time to learn, for sure he said you should go learn halakha. Okay. Thank okay. you. Yeah.